Hi everyone, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Margarita Rosa. I'm coming from California. I'm at Stanford. And um, I do projects centered around black women. Uh, first, as they resisted the, um, the force of hereditary slavery, and then after, uh, as they resisted the carceral state. So thanks so much for joining me in this conversation. I will have no slides, a little bit old school, but that means y'all be very intent on listening to the, to the presentation. So. so I've been working on this project on a person who I found in the archive for around two years. And um, you know, I went from finding this one little scrap of this person to finding maybe 80 newspaper articles from her and then prison records across Texas, California. And so it's been really fascinating to get to know more about the story. And everything that I share here is gonna sound like tea, it's gonna sound like scandal, but it's all part of newspaper archives. And so in a way, I want to expand the ways that we use archives um, and the way that we think about rumor and conjecture as part of our work. So first I'm gonna give some context um, to the presentation and then I'm gonna go into the story. So um, first of all, if you want to go to page 12, there is actually a photo of Bill Naylor. In 2015, the Journal of African American History published a special issue titled Gendering the Carceral State, African American Women, History, and the Criminal Justice System, edited by Kalyan Gross and Cheryl Hicks. This special issue concretized the study of the gender carceral state within black studies and gender studies and signaled the emergence of a solid historiographical tradition examining the lives of black riotous women and women singled out by the carceral state. Gross and Hicks urged that methodologies for examining riotous women's lives, quote, move past regarding them solely as victims or heroines, but rather as women with real interests, material, sexual, and emotional. Resisting a categorization of riotous black women as heroines allows for a more generative portrayal of their lives, one that accounts for the violence attached to geographical precarity, displacement, and migration. Riotous black women also fell in love, experienced betrayal, and desired vengeance. The archival fragments that riotous women left behind are complex and nuanced. Their survival crimes and riotous pursuits paint portraits of women who were precariously positioned, prone to violence, and likely vindictive. In Colored Amazons, Callie and Gross promotes a reading of, quote, these crimes as audible texts, close quote, as evidence of riotous women's intentions to survive and the nuanced lives they held in the process. Situating riotous black women as complex beings with multiple desires, this presentation explores Bell's actions not as heroic actions of resistance, but as deeply personal efforts to preserve her life, dignity, and sustenance. Although hundreds of riotous black women appear in the archives during this period, Bell Naylor's entries are exceptional due to, to the distinct coverage of her life, resulting in columns with detailed accounts of her actions, her movements, and even, as we see, her words. Born in Massachusetts in 1858, Bell Naylor migrated west at an early age, settling in Texas in the 1870s and later in California in the 1890s. I'm a bit short, and I do want to kind of come out here and be a little closer, so. When Belle Naylor walked into the San Francisco Hall of Justice with a revolver on May 6, 1902, she had had it with the police's persecution. Belle had recently moved to San Francisco, 
fleeing the grip of a man who told her that who told her friends that he would kill her wherever he found her. She was afraid of him and afraid of what he would do if he really did find her. But ever since she had escaped his grip and gone to San Francisco, the police had been following her every move. Being in the city with no money, Bell Naylor had taken $200 off a man in a saloon, and now everyone was talking about it. They were saying that this time, she would surely go to jail. So on a hot Tuesday afternoon, Bell resolved to go buy herself a revolver and see the police chief herself. She was fuming by the time she got to the pistol shop on the corner of Sacramento and Kearney Streets. Bell was intent on getting a pistol no matter what, but the owner of the San Rafael's gun store, noticing her fervor, refused to sell her one. But she had to get that pistol. So Bell Naylor crossed the street and tried it again. This time she would go into Lad's gun store, who she had heard would be quick to take the cash. And he was. She was able to purchase a five-chambered revolver and even had it, quote, loaded up with cartridges. Lad neatly packaged her revolver in a pasteboard box as he did for every purchase. But something made him think that the revolver wouldn't be in that box for very long. Raphael, the owner of the store who had first refused to sell her a pistol, felt this to be true and followed Belle as she made her way with the pistol down Kearney Street. Where was the woman heading? Was she heading towards the Portmount Square, the legislative center of town? It turned out she was. In front of them, Raphael could see the tall clock tower of the San Francisco Hall of Justice, the very same clock tower that would come tumbling down four years later during the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and fire. When Bell ran up the white stairs of the Hall of Justice, Raphael could not stop himself from looking at the pasteboard box that she held under her arm. Determined to stop her, Raphael ran up to her and confronted her. He could not do anything but try to reason with her. Their voices grew louder and louder, Bell Naylor telling the man to go away and the man refusing to go. What Raphael didn't know is that Bell Naylor had a plan and she wasn't going to leave without executing it. Fearing the inevitable, the gun store owner verbally fought with Bell until a detective ran towards them. He asked them what was happening, and Raphael quickly yelled out that Bell had a loaded gun and intended to use it. The detective wrangled the pasteboard box from under Bell's arms, by the way, this is all in the archives, and she lost all composure. She didn't care what they thought anymore. Um, she told them the truth that she wanted to see the chief of police. She wanted to go into the chief of police office. The detective wanted to be wrong about the thought that came to his mind. But his, birth, his worst fears proved true when inside the pasteboard box, he saw the five chambered revolver. He immediately placed Bell under arrest and pulled her into the hall of justice dragging her towards the elevator that she knew went up to the chief of police's office. Seeing all roads closing in, Bell Naylor yelled at the top of her lungs. She yelled the truth so that everyone could hear it. Quote, take me to the chief, she yelled. I must see him. And as she was dragged closer to the elevator, she yelled, the police are persecuting me and someone will have to suffer for it. In an impromptu act of desperation, or after a carefully laid out plan, Bell demanded that the officers take her to the chief of police. Bell Naylor's words reverberated through the hall as she was dragged into the elevator. She was being taken up to the chief of police's office, but he refused to see her, ordering her to be placed in the city prison. Belle was locked up, but from her cell, she kept screaming loudly so that people would hear her. Seizing the opportunity for testimony, Belle kept going on about how the police were persecuting her. And then, 
When she was approached by officers who asked her why she had been carrying a revolver, she said these really important lines. She said, they won't let me alone. And what can I do? And what can I do? These words fall into the archive like a reverberating admission. And what can I do? Resources exhausted, Bell Naylor felt defeated by the pernicious eye of the carceral state. Alone and desperate, she sought to exact the same punitive measures on the officers that they had exacted on her for so long. She has suffered so hard that she wanted someone to suffer for it, in her own words. No, someone had to suffer for it. Bell Naylor, in one, of, in one final rare case of archival le legibility, desired to be the author of her own destiny. She desired to take matters into her own hands, to write the next chapter of her story, one where she was free from, from persecution. Take me to the chief, she said. Riotous women rarely enter the archive on their own terms, but Bell Naylor's words enter the archive with a determination that might almost suggest that she knew that they would land there. By 1902, Bell Naylor had few resources available other than her body and her voice. And you know the statement I heard from Marisa Fuentes' work. She had no other resources than her body, her voice. And just as she had in 1896, Bell named her persecution sharply enough for reporters to take note. So there was a previous 19, uh, 1896 entry of her saying that the police were persecuting her. Bell's words were just sharp enough to remain a devastating testimony of her will born out of desperation and sheer exhaustion. They won't let me alone, and what can I do? And there was nothing that she could do. Two months later, in May 1902, which is the picture that you see, Bill Naylor was sentenced to prison at San Quentin State Prison, where she would spend the rest of her life. Desperation and exhaustion belong to the lexicon of resistance. Riotous black women at the turn of the 20th century led lives marked by violence and betrayal, and yet their archival remnants open possibilities for how we think of resistance. How do we account for riotous acts in moments where, where all other roles are foreclosed? How does exhaustion play into riotous action? Resisting heroic categories allows for a more generative encounter with riotous women's nuanced interests and desires. Belle Naylor was not a heroine, yet her archive challenged assumptions about the limitations of the archival record. Scandal rags, police reports, and the remnants of rumors are all feasts on repositories of micro-histories that challenge singular narratives. Riotous black women at the turn of the century wanted more than to survive history. They wanted the opportunity to thrive within it. They wanted the opportunity to fall in love and be loved back, which Belle Naylor's archive is very full of her love stories. They wanted to hold, it, hold on to the diamonds that came their way. That's part of her archive. Bell Naylor's archival record allows an entry into the interior life of a riotous woman who was intent on securing her dignity and reputation no matter what stood in the way. And that's a short profile on Bell Naylor. Um, and if you want to hear more of the tea, it's coming out in the Journal of African American History next year, a full story on Bell Naylor. Um, thank you all so much for your time.